Kiva? Yeah, I, you know what? I, I have just a question to ask Rabbi Loi since it was brought up, and then we'll go to Rabbi Philip. If that's okay with you, if I just have a, a moment. Uh, it's, go uh, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, let me just read it here. You know, I've, it's four days. I don't normally don't use this platform to pontificate or express personal feelings, but I share this with you because I feel it's a sentiment that I'm getting from other people. And I trust other people are in the same boat. Uh, and the reference to today's daf notwithstanding. But we've been back at shul for four days, and I expected to feel euphoria, joy, because for the longest time we've expressed and work on our feelings of longing. And we've developed those feelings of yearning. And frankly, it seems that the desire to come back to shul is greater than the event itself. You know, I feel like a boy who was just let back into class after a lengthy suspension. I know what that feels like. You know, the rules are strict. I feel like I'm sitting in the corner. Don't move. Don't do this. Everybody's watching you. You know, I was glad to be able to see the Rav's joy on Friday morning when he recited Sheikh Yanu without a bracha. Because I know the Rav felt the joy. I didn't feel it. I felt more relief. And I have to say honestly that the outdoor minyanim is way more comfortable. So why should I rush back? It's much more fun to stay here in the hallway. I'm comfortable. I can come in my slippers. I can wear my hat and jacket. We start later. There's, it, it's not as rigid. My shear is not in shul. My social group, there's no coffee. There's no ticket. There's too many rules. Why should I rush back to shul? The reason is, I mean, Ronan, I want to thank him for, when we met with, uh, you know, Ronan was the one who, who arranged a meeting in Morka Mandelbaum. And I spoke that time. The first thing is uh, there's a special mitzvah to daven in shul. Even if you daven be a chidus, it says you should daven in a base samedrish. The tefillah in the base medrash goes up to Shemaim much faster than outside than anywhere. There's a mitzvah to daven in a base medrash. As a Klal Yisrael, wherever they went, my, the summer I was in five countries in Europe. In the smallest community, they have these big shuls. Shul was always the center point. Yidin always knew shul is the magnet for every yid. Going to the shul, the shechina is in the shul. At home, you know, you have to listen to the tefillah. The In the shul, it's Migdash Ma'at. The Gemara calls the Devat Mekdi, you can see it's Shabbat. Migdash Ma'at, that's the base of Migdash. You know, so sometimes the Sutton sometimes comes in and makes it, you know, uh, you know, cause you waiting, waiting, waiting. And you don't, but you don't always have to feel it. Chaim Bloshner told the Goran that he's not feeling the euphoria. He says, the Iker is you do it, and your Neshama feels it. Going into a shul, the people don't have a soga, the, the, the going to be able to go into the base of Mikdush, Ma'at, the temple, Ma'at, it's just to go in there, you, you feel enveloped in the Kedusha of the base of Medrash, in the Kedusha of the base of Nessus. And uh, the reason we have the rules is because of Rafu, you know, and I mean, sure, it's at home, you don't need all these rules. But I mean, coming to shul, you might senefesh all the comfort to be able to be in shul. You know, you know the the I'm the tzvufim during the base mikdash, mishtachem and rivachem. It was stakip, was tzvufim in base mikdash. You were there. Everyone came base mikdash. Everyone standing squished. But you know, the one the one they said by rebbes coming to the tish. One of the main things is being squished together. You squish being by a tish and being squished. Coming to so sure you there's rules. The rules are so we have to remember the rules are to, for our safety and for other safety. And that's why we, we have it. And and but the, we even if we don't understand the Shama understands it. The Neshama and the 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 Kayak Haruchni that's a shul, the spiritual Kayak that you have, you have nowhere else. You, you don't even uh, you can't you can't duplicate it. So coming to Shul is uh, is, is Hashem showing, come back to my home. Come back to my home. So sometimes a child feels free in the streets. Yeah, a child runs away from home. Goes in the streets and he's a free, free for all of them. And then all of a sudden he comes home, he has rules at home. But still, you're home. You're in, you're your parents' love. You're, you're coming to show you're in Hashem's love, in Hashem's hands. You're enveloped in his, 
in his, in his, he's holding you on his shoulders, he's holding you on his knees. And that's what, what a shul is all about. So coming to shul, you feel you're with Hashem, you're there with Hashem. So sure, now because the rules, it's hard, but it, it's better to be at home with rules to be in the streets. In the streets, all things can happen in the streets. The streets are not so safe. There's nothing safer than being in the home of Hashem. There's nothing, there's nothing more safe than being. Hashem hafti ma'im be'secha. You, you love, and, and, and so sometimes there's a hosa sotim and fanein machrein, the other sotim goes both ways. Sometimes the sotim comes and says, you know, you look, you're not even feeling this. Uh, that's a sotim saying. It. But really, even if you don't feel it, your neshama feels it. And, and I want to thank Ronan, really. It took, uh, you know, uh, he was still, air sure, was still late mid afternoon. He was working to Babel and it, it worked. Baruch Hashem. Look, we, we got both things we wanted. We wanted a, a gathering of 10 for a minion. We got into shul, and, and, and it's only the members of parliament, together with the minister and, and the premier, who, who, who listened to our tefillahs, and Hashem listened to our tefillahs. That, so I want to thank that Baruch Hashem, we could be in shul, and, and, and the feelings are as um, I say, Sotan, my Sotan comes to feel, the Sotan comes on, you know, the, the, the worst, the biggest Sotan is when a Sotan makes a person feel that he's not, you know, you're not in the right, that's a Sotan. Because really, you, there, you then Shama feels the highest, and you'll see, you'll feel it. And the Vaishu helped that we should all be Zaycha, that through this shul, we should go to the big shul of the Beis Amir, the Shemir Biyamayin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Rabbi Philip, you and I discussed, uh, speaking of backyards, what's going on, where because all the amusement parks are closed, uh, my backyard has become from a mini Migdash Ma'at into a mini Canada's Wonderland. With um, The kids are drawing up all kinds of plans to build stages and, and ropes, so I want to know the Hilchas Shabbos regarding uh, uh, the world. What are we they called um, zip lines. Okay. No, the ones that are tied to two trees and they go sliding across. Zip lines. Zip lines. Thank you, Avigdor. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, we're going to go to uh, discuss halach and hilchas Shabbos. And this halach is brought down in the in uh, to Shabbos because we're basing it. It's a little bit ahead. This is going to daf nun hey. The Gemara speaks about also the shtamish betzidei ilon. Gemara speaks about it. Uh, the one cannot use with the tzid ilon. The Ravashi brings this down. I mean, it's in the side of the tree. We'll discuss that. What that means. Okay. But the tzid in, That means the side of the side. That would be permissible. So the, the Ran explains that that therefore it's usher will be pro, uh, prohibited to take a ladder. Lismoich asulam, or the, based on the, the Gemara says this to take a sulam and to put it directly on the side of the tree, on the to the trunk of the tree. The chisolik why? Because when he climbs uh, the ladder. Is He's actually using on this actually the side of the of the tree. This is brought based on the Gemara. But if there's a peg or a bar, or, um, a pole that's tukua that's fastened, ilan right on the side of the tree. Mutter sulam alav. Then you can actually lean the tree on the on the bar or on the peg. The Havale, why? Because now the Yosseid, this bar, is considered its dodin. That's part of the side of the tree. And the Sulam is Tzidei Tzdodin. That's exactly an example of a side, of a, the side of a side. That's Allah. And therefore, in Shachan, it's in Shin Lamed Vav. Allah is, that brings down from this Allah, also the Shtamish, but Tzidei Ilan. You can't use the side of the tree. Aval but Tzidei Tzdodin, the side of a side, Mutter Lefikach. The exact example that's brought down in the Gemara. It's also Lisma Hasulam. You can't lean it a ladder. Litsideya Ilan. So if you want to to the side of the tree, the chisolik, because when you climb the ladder, Mishtamish Bitstodin. But if you use a peg or a bar, as we said, to on, on the side of the tree and you lean it on top of that, mutter lisma sulam alav. That it's permissible to do the sulam alav. And this is just important to point out, as the Mishta Brewer mentions this halacha. And that this is not talking about on actual on Shabbos itself. On Shabbos itself, you can't even do tzidei tzadin. You can't even do this on the side of a side. This is if it's done on Erev Shabbos, then you can actually do it on Shabbos as well. 
So that would be the halacha. And the same thing would be another case, another example is let's say if Noatz, if you fasten a peg, Yosef, a peg, and you hang on the peg a basket, the Yosef, the peg is considered its dodin, the side, which is usher to use on Shabbos. And therefore you can't remove the basket on Shabbos because you're actually using this, it's, it's called Sidei Ilan. But the basket is considered Sidei Tzdodin. That means to say the basket, if you want to take anything out, use anything from within the basket, that would be considered Sidei Tzdodin. So therefore, the question is, if let's say I have a swing, and I want to attach the, I have the swing, the seat, and then I have the chains, right, to, to the, uh, uh, as well, to, to the seat, and I want to take the chain and tie it to the tree, would that be considered Sidei Tzdodin? Because the, tr- the, uh, the seat is it, I mean, let's go the other way around. The chain is it tzedodin, and the seat would be considered tzedet tzedodin. The answer is it's not correct. This is why the Mishnah Baruah points this out in Simon Shin Hay, in a similar case where it's also, we, we discuss tzedodin and tzedet tzedodin is regarding riding on an animal. An animal, uh, right? Reichman, if you're not allowed to ride an animal because of gezera, you might come be toilish, you might tear off a branch. So there the Allah also says that it's considered the animals, considered anything leaning on the animal is tzedodin. And then the same Allah would be tzedet tzedodin, just like by a tree. Now over here the Mishtabrura points out and says, that he says that anything that is attached to, to the behema, lishtamash al daf, a board, hayoitzi chutz, he says, la gola, machirel from behind it, gam kein oser, beloi mikre tzedet tzedodin, so a chain and like in a seat, Anything a fast the hakol kli echadu, because this is all considered one kli. So therefore, a swing with chains and it's attached to the tree. That's not considered tzidei tzdodin. That's considered tzidodin because you're actually using the tree. So the chain and the swing is all considered as tzidodin and it's aser. That what says Allah is. When will it be permissible? As it says, it's brought down tzidei tzdodin would be if you have a peg. If let's say if I attach. As it's brought down, Shlomo Zalman Orbach brings us down. I mean, it, it, it says, I mean, that what's considered seed eight and based on what we learned even without this, I mean, just uh, uh, practical what we spoke. It says, the Allah says that if, let's say, um, if someone takes a peg and he, t- a t- before, again, before Shabbos, he says, and it just, he brings a, it says, uh, you have a swing, a nad nedad, that's what called in Hebrew, uh, a nad nedad, there's a swing, hatluya mi boidyoin, al moit. Hakavua. So let's say you have a pole, a pole that's leaning on the tree. So have, let's say from one side to another. And to the pole, you actually put the swing, but the pole is resting on the tree. That would be considered a tzidei tzdodin. That's considered tzidei tzdodin. So the question would be the same thing with a hammock. Wait, can I use a hammock on Shabbos? It's again, the same halacha is similar to the tree. That if it's directed, even if the tree, even if it's, let's say, with a hook, so it's going around the tree and it's... Uh, even with a hook, would be considered like all one kli echad. The only way of it would be permissible if it's either through a peg, a bar that is connected to the tree, and then to that you connect it to the tree, that would be considered tzidei tzdodin. The question is also with a zip line would be the same thing. So if any of that sort, again, you have tzdodin and tzidei tzdodin. I'm not paskin halacha lamaisa, telling what it is. The rub will tell us exactly, again, when it comes to zip lining, what would be permissible again? But there's one thing, if I may be able to point out, this is, it says in the Shulchan Ramah says, all this is good. Again, the Tzidei Tzdodin is mutur liga be'ilam, to touch the tree. Abavad denu, the tree is not allowed to move. So you can't put it by the branches where it's going to move. But if I put it by the trunk in a way where actually, again, based on the Tzidei Tzdodin, then there is maybe a het, that would be the heter to do it. At kan Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Fulam. Uh, I hope that that we have somehow a chance to show exactly what's going on, so the kids, both my own and the neighbors, get to really learn Hilchas Shabbos from it. Okay, thank you, Roman. You ready, MPP Roman? Roman Baber is the member of provincial parliament for the riding of York Centre. Roman was elected in June 2018 Ontario election and currently serves as chair of Parliament's standing committee on justice policy. Roman is a lawyer, called to the Ontario Bar in 2006, and practiced law until his election, primarily in the areas of insurance and commercial litigation. 
He attended high school at W.L. McKenzie Collegiate Institute, obtained a BA from York University and graduated law school at the University of Western Ontario. Roman was born and raised in the Soviet Union until the age of eight and then lived in Israel until the age of 15. He immigrated to Canada um, it, with his family in 1995 and settled in the heart of York Center at Shepherd and Bathurst. Roman is an occasional, occasional lecturer at an after school program engaging high school students on constitutional and criminal law topics. He is a member of the Jewish Russian Community Center. And even though Jewish people don't believe in dinosaurs, he's a loyal fan of the Toronto Raptors. So thank you for coming on to the program, which is sponsored, by the way, by Toronto Kosher and torontokosher.com. Guests on Loop Radio will receive gift certificates, either yourself or to the charity of your choice from Toronto Kosher, Toronto's premier destination, for beef chicken deli and now meat sushi. So have you ever tried meat sushi? I don't think it's a cuisine in the Soviet Union or Israel. Neither. And I'm hoping we're going to come back to our favorite kosher restaurants soon enough. Okay. Well, first of all, we wanted you to come on to give you a, give us an opportunity to thank you uh, for all the work you've done on behalf of the community along with uh, Gila Marto, the MPP for Thornhill, and Robin Martin, the MPP for Eglinton Lawrence. You have lobbied on our behalf to the government. So we thank you for that. Thank you. I'd like to revisit the pre-Shavuot almost opened the doors for business, but I'm, I'm sure it was politics at its best. And we'll get back to worse. the time of, what's that? At its worst. <laughs> But I, I'd, I'm curious to know, how did the government arrive at the 30% capacity? It seems to be a different uh, measuring stick, if you will, than the methods employed by most states and provinces who deal usually with headcount. Yeah, so look, one of the things that I continue to find perplexing, perhaps justifiably, is the amount of deference that we give public health. In other words, there's very little appetite on behalf of the politicians to argue with the chief medical officer of health. And uh, so, so we try to adhere as much as we can to their advice. And the principle by which the 30% was arrived at was not necessarily by headcount, as opposed to the ability to physically distance within the premises. So at 30%, the thinking was, there's enough space for everyone to create space on both sides and, and avoid close contact indoors so as to decrease the prospect of transmission of the virus. So uh, let me understand this. So we can have 30, up to 30% capacity for a gathering of prayer. You can, you can gather at 30% of the building's capacity. Correct. And, and that is a total. So I went back and I looked into this. It's not as if you can go room by room and say 30% of the capacity of the room. You got to take the entire structure, figure out what is the fire code allowable capacity for the entire building and have 30% of it. That will, according to public health, enable the leaving of sufficient physical space around you so as to be able to keep a proper distance. So a wedding hall and a funeral parlor have the same rules? So um, I, I believe the announcement already come out as of this week, uh, you'll be able to have up to 50 people in a gathering of a wedding or um, funeral, um, but the, the natural question is, well, for many folks, including ourselves, um, a chuppah, a wedding, is a religious ceremony. And so the presumption is, if you're inside the shul, you are able to go as far as 30%. So, I, I, so you can go to 30, I, I don't get this, 30% of the building could be more than 50 people. Correct. And yet I can't have more than 50. For, I, I, will, I will 
come back to this. Um, I'll, I'll owe you a precise reply. I need to look up if, if okay. outdoor ceremony is 50 or if the indoor could be 50. But technically, I see no reason why you cannot gather as many folks as you want for a religious ceremony as long as you are at under 30% capacity. So a chuppah would be considered a religious ceremony, but the reception would not. I don't believe that the chief public officer of health ruled on this question of Allah. I don't believe that has happened. Because okay. I believe... I uh, wouldn't ask him either. Okay. Well, we know that dancing at a wedding is halacha. but we'll get to yes. that. Yes. In fact, and, and unfortunately, um, public health has articulated that dancing is, and singing and something that should probably be avoided for now, I can... I recognize the difficulty and the absurdity that it creates against uh, our traditions, but unfortunately, such as such as the um, temporary reality that we're subjected to these days. Okay. The provinces seem to dictate who what is essential service and what isn't. I don't know if the yeah. feds do or not. But I have a friend who I shall name Joe, uh, Joe Simon. He has a company called Premier. He's in the HVAC business. And he's deemed by your government, by the provincial government, as essential service. When he comes, he goes into the U.S. and he comes back across the border into Ontario, does he have to quarantine? So... Two distinct issues. The essential services list is a provincial list. The provinces control property and civil rights and, and overall commerce. So in the province's wisdom or lack thereof, the province would determine other under various prerequisites and, and public health levels of alert and urgency, who at a given point is an essential or not. However, when you cross outside, when you cross the border, when you exit Canada and come back, you're subject to the federal jurisdiction that deals with our borders. And right now the federal government has the quarantine act in effect, which suggests that doesn't matter who you are, when you return to Canada from outside of its borders, by virtue of the Quarantine Act, you have to strictly self-isolate for 14 days. So they're not necessarily, they don't play one with, with each other. If you, if you left Canada and come back to Canada, you have to quarantine for 14 days until the federal government says you no longer have to do that. So there's no essential service as far as the federal government is concerned? Those are two different regimes. The federal government concerns visitors and travelers and in, in, in your example, they're in charge of coming in and out. In our context, in the provincial context, there are classes of industries and some industries have been designated as essential services. For the wisdom of its system or lack thereof, again, it's no system is perfect and certainly this one was not perfect. The essential service component is now becoming secondary because the province is largely moving into stage two, where almost all industries are permitted to resume it, subject to public health regulations. Toronto, uh, Peel region and Windsor region are not there yet, but the hope is we'll be there within a couple of weeks. Uh, speaking of the province wide, um, I know that the city of Toronto, by law, this is what I heard from Councillor Pasternak, is not allowed to run a deficit. And the talk is about increasing property tax to compensate of up to 47%. The provincial government, if they come to me and they ask for a 47% increase in my property tax, I'm going to say that the assessment on my house is way too high. So I will inundate MPAC and to say that they're 
I know that the tax assessment, the percentage is done by the city, but the value is done by the province. I'll say that my house is not worth as much. You, look, when the taxman comes along, <laughs> there's not much we generally get to say regretfully. Uh, the scenario we're discussing here is where taxes are not gonna be necessarily pegged to the value of your house. Right now, the rule of thumb, the unofficial rule of thumb is that they're approximately 1% of the value of the house, it's a municipal type scheme. But I understand from my friends on city council and Councillor Pasternak, who's, who's a close colleague, that um, the city is gonna be running uh, about a billion and a half budget shortfall. This is a very difficult situation, no doubt. Unfortunately, revenues have dried up for all levels of government. When economic activity decreases, so is the tax revenue. And unfortunately, we're gonna have to find ways to make that up. There are ongoing conversations between all three levels of government to figure out ways for the municipal government to uh, become solvent. Um, in other words, to, to be able to make up its budget shortfall, whether it's by direct assistance or other methods. This is an ongoing conversation. I would not, I, my hope is, I mean, certainly on the provincial side, you're not gonna see a proper a, a tax increase. I, I cannot speak for the city of Toronto. I, I, I doubt that at, at a time of difficult times economically is not the time to be raising taxes on folks. So I'm hoping that that will not happen. Have you heard at all any instances of what we call a chil Hashem? Have there been any summons issued for backyard minyanim? Have you heard comments about a Jews behaving one way or the other? I certainly have not heard anything from my government channels or within government with respect to any violations or charges filed. So, of course, anecdotally, I hear of folks having minyan when they shouldn't, but... I was born in, as during my intro, I was born in the Soviet Union. Um, I remember what it's like to fear to hold a religious ceremony. And uh, I'm very saddened that this is, this is where we were. Um, at, at the same time, I, I, I think that to a large extent, our community has answered the call and has largely adhered to public health measures. The, the schools are closed, uh, the camps are closed. Is there talk of starting the school year a little bit earlier and possibly increase the vacation time in 2021? Uh, everything's on the table and the education minister is weighing various options. Um, it feels as if the health curve is, is an ongoing and developing conversation. We continue learning more about the virus. We assess our prospect of success in containing the virus. And so now in the middle of June, it's a bit tough to gauge where we may be two months from now. So these are ongoing conversations, but coming to certain conclusions is very difficult at this time because this is a evolving position. When the feds make a certain decision, how much input do the provinces have? How much does Trudeau really listen to Ontario? Um, that <laughs> I meant to put you on the spot. If you feel that, like you put on the that spot, question, that's exactly the point. I, I mean, that question may be somewhat be beyond me. However, it certainly depends on, on the nature of the question. How intertwined are the issues? Are we enforcing something that's whose jurisdiction it is? who gets to weigh into it. But one thing I can tell you 
that has been apparent throughout this crisis is that all levels of government rose to the challenge of having collegial and cooperative and coordinated actions to help one another. I have no doubt, and, and that manifests itself in York Center between myself, Councillor Pasternak, MP Michael Levitt. And to a large extent, I think that Canadians feel that that has also happened on the macro scale between the mayor, the premier, and the prime minister. So I think that there is collegial relationship, there's cooperation, something I think Canadians are looking to. And, but in terms of micro decisions, which are up to an individual level of government, that is not something I can comment on. But certainly everybody has been working well together. Okay, if there's any questions, by the way, from the participants, you can unmute, raise your hand or text and I'll gladly read it. I guess this is, it leads into the next question. The Jewish community is relatively small, small as far as the electorate is concerned. They don't have a, a lot of votes. They have significant votes, certainly in your writing, but overall, a lot of them are American and they don't vote in big numbers. How, do they still weigh somewhat of influence? Do you still, we still have the premier's ear here? It's a good question. Look, we have three Jewish MPPs. Uh, that's Gila Marto, myself, and a girl named Andrea Kanjan from Barrie. We also have two additional predominantly Jewish write writings with a considerable amount of Jewish electorate. That's Robin Martin's writing, the, Martin, the, the writing in which you're situated, and King Vaughn's, Steve, Steve Lech's writing, the Minister of Education. So, you muted. Continue. Victor? I think, I'm, I think I'm muted. Okay, now. You're, you're good. So, so, the answer to your question is we definitely participate in the political process. We have large presence, but more importantly, the Jewish community as a whole has a significant, a significant chunk of the vote in at least five ridings. Eglinton Lawrence, my riding of York Center, which is the west side of North York, Thornhill, King Vaughan, and Richmond Hill. So we are still a material vote to five swing seats, to at least three or four swing seats other than Thornhill. So that's the practical answer. Yes, we, we do count. The, on top of that, I have reason to believe that the premier is welcoming of the Jewish community and understands the needs of this community just like any other community. And does the Jewish community have the year of the government? Absolutely. And uh, we have seen evidence of that a couple of weeks ago even though we weren't fully successful. I, I guess that leads me to my final question. Uh, and if anybody else has some more, one of the hallmarks of the Jewish people is that they never give up hope. And I guess you coming from the Soviet Union in Israel, it's, it's in your blood. We never give up hope. And, and Rabbi Lowy, having worked with him for the last uh, three months, he's unclear that you don't give up hope. And even as late as 12 o'clock on Erev Yantiv, we believe that the shul were, were going to be was going to be open. What was the final hurdle that you couldn't get around? And I know you were lobbying it. Rabbi Lois sings your praises, and we're going to get him to sing some more of them in a moment and give you a blessing. But how close were we? The difficulty is weighing practical concepts such as the ability to properly physically distance versus arbitrarily imposed rules that are designed to mitigate risk. To clarify what I'm saying, a lot of folks within the government believe 
that if we can properly physically distance ourselves on parking lot, then we would not be violating any principle. And there was no reason for the chief public officer of health to not award us with that, with that ruling. Despite the common sense of the proposition, the chief public officer of health, who's a very cautious, in my view, very, very uh, aggressive on mitigation measures, said, I do not want to have a situation where I now need to open to religious gatherings all around the province because we are not out of the woods yet. Because what had to happen was we would have to have the Christian congregations come out of the car. It would have been the Jewish community was going to move the needle for everyone else. And that was a very big moving of the needle that Dr. Williams was unwilling to go to. So I am, I'm not looking for, for compliments or praise. I'm just looking for your patience, your sovlanut, your avana, your understanding of the tough situation that public service finds itself in when it is responsible for the well being of folks. And that's not to say that I do not recognize that prayer and worship is an essential service. If, if the liquor store is an essential service, then the shul is certainly an essential service. In my view, they both are. <laughs> so I, I, I don't mean to belittle that. And I'm, I'm sorry that we've been put through these circumstances. I'm just relieved that we're finally able to have a little bit of semblance of normal. And I'm very hopeful that we'll go back to somewhat normal fairly soon. Thank you. I, I have one question here that's been texted to me. And if the cases rise to a certain number, will they roll back or discontinue shuls being allowed to open? I cannot speak for what they're going to do. I would defer to the public officer of health on that. I think we've got a pretty, we're, we're getting a handle on what is happening. We're, we're seeing that for better or for worse, well, unfortunately, we're, we're seeing mortality in congregate settings. By and large, the community at large is, is doing okay. And in my view, we need to continue to cautiously reopen the economy and our lives as we're permitted to do by public health. So God, Khalila, I, I do not, I, I, I certainly hope that we don't get there and we should not get there. And that's what we're working on right now. And I think we're very close. There's a few more questions here, but we're running out of time. So I'll email them to you if that's okay. I just want to run over the program tomorrow night, the annual sisterhood shall should us say 8 p.m. Please RSVP. Uh, unlike every year, there's no leftover for the men. Thursday to accommodate Mincha Loop Radio will start at, at 7.55. Uh, we also have the Hasna of Yossi, as we mentioned. Uh, on a channel to be determined. We wish him and his family a safe trip. Sounds like Shabbos Mavorch and Tammuz. Yes, it is. This Shabbos is at 515. Please contact me for sponsorship. Thank you, the Air Zoom controllers of Vigdor and Shlemi Feintoch. At this time, the Rav, as always, has the final. Yeah. <clears throat> I, mean, I once heard from our Shiva and tells every year we got Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And we ask, let me see my mute. We ask the Dabin from Hashem for everything. So some people will ask, it doesn't happen. We're Dabin ready years and years. So that time he gave an example. Right next to Tells in Cleveland, they were building a highway. Now it's already finished. This was in the, the late, in the 50s, 60s. And they're building and building and building. And it looks like nothing is happening. All of a sudden, you see there's a new highway. 
It says everything we do at the end, even if you don't see right away the fruit of your product. I think Roman, what they did, what he did, really helped at the end. We got what we needed at the end. You know, sometimes you need patience. I don't know that. But I, it's good to have someone from the government, like Roman and the other uh, uh, Jewish representatives who really and understand. And I know they, I know they, they really tried till the last minute, but they're right there. You know, the, the chief officer of health felt and you know she has her right and because she knows Jewish people aren't Zaki people. It's, it's a whole big community and we accepted it. You know, we accept whatever, but we, I know that the digging and the plowing that was done then really helped. And at the end, so it's only a week later, you know, they came, you know, the, the Monday came and they said, we could, at the end of the week, we'll be able to die. And, We'll be able to uh, to go to shul. I want to thank our Jewish representative, special Roman, for everything he did. And I'm sure uh, sometimes you're frustrated; it doesn't help right away, but it, it does work. If you're digging the highway, at the end you have a beautiful highway. Everything you do really helps. Hashem should give you all the brachos. You have a beautiful home, and in, in a home that you'll have in Mir Hashem, build a beautiful home. With a beautiful wife and children, and you should be able to enjoy life with, uh, in, in spiritually and physically, and also with, with any, all your needs. And thank you for everything you're doing. And Hashem should give you a bracha, a batzlacha, and everything you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Though I, I'm again, I'm, I'm, I'm very humble, and. Um, I got into public service. I left a very lucrative law practice, got into the business of public service because I wanted to bring my skills to government to try and fix the multitude of issues that we've inherited and, and are currently facing. We have never anticipated a situation like this. And um, it's it's been remarkable and very difficult. But our community and by that I mean the Jewish community at large through generations anywhere on this earth has persevered through, I would venture to say two means. One is our faith and the other one is the support that we give one another, our community support. And if there was ever a time, I think in, in our lifetimes in this generation where we have to string together and get through something this that time is now and and by that i mean both to maintain our faith in order to not just fulfill our mitzvahs but also sustain our our health and mental health and optimism and and the way to carry forward so that's one element sustaining our faith and the second element is helping our community helping us sustain by helping our community Regretfully, every day I'm hearing heartbreaking stories. Um, folks are really struggling. Seniors are struggling. Various communities are struggling. This is the time, if there was ever, to, to try and help one another. So of, of everything that will come through, through the difficulty of COVID, I'm hoping to, to see some of the light through those two facets, our faith and our community work, which has sustained us always. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, if you're still here, I'll make you host. There yeah, I'm is. here. I'm at the top, I think. I'll make you host. Yeah. Okay. Go in just one second. I'm just Akiva? Yes, sir. What were they saying about the liquor board?